pleasure to, to have Tomek Maciążek from the University of Bristol joining us virtually. So Tomek has been connected to CTP for a long time because he was or a student or undergrad student of Adam already and partially me, I guess 2012, 13, something like that. Then he did PhD with, with Adam Sabinski, so and but Tomek specializes in uh, application of geometrical and topological methods in broadly understood quantum mechanics, but including quantum information. Right, and, and currently Tomek is a vice chancellor fellow in the University of Bristol in the School of Mathematics. So I guess uh, you're a mathematician, not physicist now. Um, uh, well, actually, ma mathematical physics is a part of mathematics in the UK. Okay, so I haven't I haven't switched. <laughs> right. So, uh, Tomek did a lot of work on entanglement classification using algebraic geometry on uh, some like non-abelian statistics on, uh, on graphs, as far as I remember. So, so he knows a lot about geometry topology. Uh, and today he was kind enough to agree to like give us a, as far as I see from the abstract like some introduction to topological quantum computing which sounds cool uh, yeah so I'm excited all of us are excited yeah please don't like uh, the, the screen is yours okay thanks uh, there's some message in the chat uh... <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> no, I was just joking. Don't mind it. Yeah. Okay. So I'll start. Okay. So the title of the talk is uh, Fundamental Aspects of uh, Topological Quantum Computing on Quantum Wire Networks. And uh, I'll start. So, okay. The outline of, of the talk is, the, is as follows. Uh, first, I'm starting with the outline of the talk. Then uh, I'm I'll give you a short introduction to some general concepts uh, of topological quantum computing, uh, a shorthand TQC. Then I'll move to uh, topological quantum computing with Majorana edge states, which are the primary example of, uh, of what I'm interested in. Uh, and then I'll move to a more abstract and general setting of uh, topological quantum uh, computing on wire networks. So let's start with the general concepts. Uh, so we've got, uh, I'd like to start with a notion uh, of so-called emergent onions, which are uh, responsible for the mechanism that's used in uh, topological quantum computing. Uh, so what we generally start with is a quantum system of uh, a number of interacting particles, which are normally uh, electrons. Uh, and those electrons, we, we imagine they are constrained to move into two dimensions. So, for instance, there, uh, what can happen is that there is some, in the z, z direction, there is some uh, strong potential that keeps them constrained in, in the plane. Uh, and uh, those electrons interact according to some, some Hamiltonian. Uh, so, so what's important is that the positions and the moment are in, in, in the plane. Uh, now, what's uh, necessary is that this Hamiltonian has a gapped ground space, and the ground space will be denoted by H G S. Uh, gapped it means that there is an energy gap, which is between a finite energy gap with, between uh, this space and all excited levels. Uh, and uh, sorry, Tomek. So yes. gapped means like it doesn't close with the system size. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, or, or generally you have some, yeah, if you take large N, for instance, then uh, you, this gap doesn't close. Thanks. Uh, and uh, then the Hamiltonian uh, has some wave functions, yes, so we consider some uh, grand, grand state wave functions, uh, and we assume that they depend parametrically on some parameters. Uh, that are in on the plane too. So that's quite an abstract setting. Uh, yeah, but th that's uh, that's what's happening in those settings. So we've got some Hamiltonian that in fact has some parameters that depend uh, on uh, that are from R two. 
uh, m parameters, and there is a so the wave function also fails, depends parametrically on those. Uh, so then, uh, what we can do? So okay, and then we have this uh, parametric dependence of an eigenfunction, and an eigenfunction of a multiparticle Hamiltonian, it, and be, and can be called a quasi-particle. So it's like some collective uh, motion of some of many particles, some collective behavior. Uh, and we are looking at it as a at, uh, at it as a quasi particle, um, or it can actually we can um, also. So like one more question. So the the ground space is it degenerate or not? Uh, it can be the generally yes. It can be degenerate. Uh, it can be non degenerate. Um, but yeah, we would like to have the the. the uh, we would like to consider also consider the general ground spaces mainly actually so uh, so the main notion so uh, okay so we've got those parameters and we say that those uh, parameters are, are positions of sort of anions so what the setting is it's the abstract setting is that we are saying that those r1 to rm are positions of some quasi particles uh, and these are called and we call those particles anions, uh, and I, I hope uh, I will motivate this name soon. Uh, or maybe actually the, the motivation starts now. So the consider uh, we consider an adiabatic transport of such a wave function. So everything is uh, so so nicely prepared for adiabatic uh, transport because we have this gap, energy gap. So we can, if we slowly vary those coefficients, r1 to rm, then we stay in the same ground space, in the same eigenspace of the Hamiltonian. Uh, and we take such a curve in those in this parameter space, uh, which which is a loop. So it's it starts uh, a loop. Okay, so uh, let, let's do it slowly. So it is uh, so we've got this parametric dependence and uh, we assume that the initial positions of anions are the same as final positions. Modulo some permutation, but then, uh, so if you, if you make a picture of onions, uh, we say that they are indistinguishable, then it's the same uh, uh, configuration, the, the initial configuration is the same as the final one. Okay, so, and, and also, and this condition uh, tells us that the Hamilton, the initial Hamiltonian is the same as the final Hamiltonian. So we are re really staying in the same eigenspace after the transport. So maybe uh, some some of the students who are present here, maybe they can remember uh, if they had this adiabatic theorem uh, at the quantum mechanics course, maybe they can remember that uh, if this uh, ground space is, is non-degenerate, so there is just a single wave function, then if we transport it, if we take such an adiabatic transport, then what can happen is that uh, we get some global phase uh, associated, associated that multiplies the wave function after the transport, right? So we are staying in the same ground space, modular global phase. But what's happening, happening in general is that the final state is, some, is related to the initial state by some unitary transformation. Uh, if the ground space is, non is, uh, is degenerate. Uh, and we say that this operator u uh, is topologic protect, topologically prot protected if it's invariant with respect to continuous deformation of this path. Uh, and maybe there are a few words what these are called anions. Uh, so the, the, this condition here is important that the initial con configuration is the same as the final one. So uh, what happens along the path along this path R1 of T, Rm T, they could have exchanged on the way, right? Uh, because you are doing everything uh, as set, looking at them as sets. So if they have exchanged, then this operate, operator U tells us what's happening, to, happens to the wave function if, uh, if the, part, the anions have exchanged. Um, and it can be quite arbitrary. So uh, this, why does it, why, this is why you have any here. <laughs> If these are bosons, we would have always u equal to identity. Fermions, it's always minus one. 
uh, anions, it's an arbitrary transformation. So, uh, so I can ask. So, uh, just general. Uh, okay, I, I just want to be clear because you're pre presenting in a very clean and uh, understandable way. Just I'm a bit confused about because in principle you can have all this stuff, uh, all this adiabatic stuff, and operation you applied to the ground space. Uh, if you just had just distinguishable particles, right? Uh, yes. So then, like, is it uh, formally, is it you first define this problem on uh, uh, on distinguishable particle, uh, distinguishable particles, and then you kind of take some, uh, then you take some portion, or you to begin with, you are in the space of distinguishable particles. Uh, um or it really doesn't matter or uh, yeah so what's important here is that so this r1 to rm you mean do, do you do I treat them in this two as indistingu indistinguishable or not right uh, yeah 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 so what's important i think here is, is this condition that the hamiltonian really depends only on the uh, on the set on the set yes and i this, see and this makes the, all this transformation really depends only on the on the set, mm -hmm. not on the mm -hmm. on the arrangement. So it may not. Okay. So then I just uh, because this is actually the, uh, like typically. I mean, okay. Uh, I'm, I'm not <laughs> an expert in those things. Like typically, this uh, ions are introduced in somehow very magical way. So you are presenting it in a much. It's kind of. Uh, it's I'm much less suspicious about it. Uh, just so, so the, the starting point is basically this invariance of so, so this Hamiltonian that encodes the ground space, like just depends on the on the set, not on the order of those yeah. parameters. Yes, yes, that's my. And mind. this number, just to be clear, this number of parameters is basically would be the number of uh, anions, effectively. Uh, number of anions, yes, but the degeneracy of the ground space is uh, it's. Uh, in, in, it, it, it can be kind of determined by M, but it's like a, a, okay. it's, not, it's not so clear at the moment how it depends on M. Uh, okay. Uh, so now, okay, let's uh, do a small summary. We have, we've got those eigenfunctions. Uh, and now, Typically, what's happening in such systems is, is that the dimension of the ground space is proportional to 2 to the m. Uh, so uh, if you want to now have like some, some part of the story that connects to the to quantum gate or quantum information, is that we are looking at this ground space as the Hilbert space of some number of qubits, but it's, it's smaller, the number of qubits is smaller than 2 to the m for uh, it depends on the physical settings, but it's it's always smaller than really this number of onions. Uh, uh, and now, uh, let's say that we have an, some onion on in our position R one, and another onion in position R two. And now, with time, we exchange them. So we this one goes here, and uh, this one goes here. Uh, so what, uh, according to what I've just said, is that the, the final wave function is just a multi-qubit quantum gate acting on the initial wave function. Now, uh, okay, at the moment, it's still not clear how to map qubits to this uh, ground space, but uh, I'll, I'll make it clearer when I talk about, when I will talk about my runoff uh, But so far, it's, it's, it's still be quite abstract. Um, and now in the topologically projected scenario, <coughs> uh, this gate does not depend on how I exactly do this exchange. Uh, so I can deform those uh, word lines as I want uh, uh, in a continuous way. So Tomek, mm -hmm. so why uh, is there any reason why this M prime has to be strictly less than M? Why cannot I have M qubits? Because like, it seems that 
if uh, uh, the dimension is two to the power m, then no, then uh, so uh, okay, this is because uh, I think it will be clear if I talk about about my own fermions, but generally what's happening if you've got those abstract abstract models of onions, those Fibonacci onions or Ising onions, then you've got a number of onions, but the uh, to really have a qubit, you have you need to have more onions than qubits. So you could, there are some redundant onions to you know you need some ancillary so you need to be after examples, yes? Yeah, yeah. You need some ancillary onions to have a qubit. So is it big because you have some maybe super selection rules? Yeah, something like that, yes, yes. So for, for my own affirmance, it will be parity. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So just, uh, I know that you explained an example, but is there like a family of models that are, let's say, I, I very much like this picture when we have really like a physical Hamiltonian and uh, yeah. <laughs> really like it's well defined, not something ad hoc. Uh, even if it's, if it's a model, so is it like that? Does every like ba basically all the angles that are out there can be defined kind of rigorously by having some Hamiltonian like that and by doing this procedure? Yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is like so. This is uh, if you look at this. Uh, Paper by Michael Friedman uh, about quantum and, and others by quantum uh, review paper on quantum topological quantum computing. Then they call it emergent onions, a model of emergent onions, because they yes because they emerge from a Hamiltonian. Uh, okay, so then uh, so we've got this gate, and then uh, I was saying that the. The transformation is uh, we don't really have to exactly know how we exchange those two onions. We only need to say that this is a simple braid, uh, and uh, okay, I'll, I'll define it on the next slide. But intuitively, this is a simple braid uh, up to continuous deformations, and it realizes gate U. Uh, and this gate is derived from the Hamiltonian by con by computing Barry connection. Uh, yeah, but now I have to know that this uh, somehow this uh, adiabatic transport, which comes from the Hamiltonian and so on, that it does not depend on path. Uh, on uh, it depends only yes. on the homotopy of the path because yes. if it is not so, uh, it will not work. Yeah, So I, I had this uh, assumption: is uh, if this operator is invariant, then it's called topologically protective. But uh, of course, ah, it's, uh, okay. sorry, I didn't. Uh, I yeah. forgot this. Sorry. <laughs> so it's a, it's another assumption, but the the, the key point is that it's it, uh, this assumption is not empty. So uh, uh, th there really are physical systems that have this property. Mm. Um, so and one more maybe naive question. So like the reason why you had two dimensional system to begin with was that to to have this gradient loop maybe appear. Yeah. Because yeah. If you had three uh, D, it won't be like. Yes. We, uh, yeah. Yes, in 3D, it's the, then you will have just the permutation group. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then it's okay. Okay, so, okay, I probably will be, right. So, so in, in the end, like the representations of this group, like this group would be like a, a like case that represent with representations of this group and uh, representations of the symmetric group are much like. Uh, but simply they're very small and then you cannot do universal computation um about uh, there is some maybe hmm, about this i'm not sure maybe you can do some quantum computation with, with those representations but the thing is that uh, uh, there is this result from the 70s that somehow that shows that any representation of this uh, symmetric group unitary representation defines in fact Fermions or bosons in this in this case, so we have to do some. It's not so easy to see it, but they they, they show somehow that uh, mm -hmm. it's, you get only bosons or fermions uh, in this in this way. 
Okay, I, I won't stop you. I'm uh, I'm thrilled to hear what you have to say. And like there are those uh, those graphs happening later, so you will explain them. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. So now we've got those simple braids, and they are defined uh, as follows. So we've got m onions, and we say that sim simple braid sigma i exchanges onion i with i plus one. And it's uh, and then you have to believe me that any exchange can be written as a composition of those simple braids. It can be a very complicated one, but uh, it's always possible. Uh, and uh, they are subject to some <coughs> to one very natural relation. Uh, so if you compose uh, sigma one, sigma two with sigma one, this is what this is the so the, the resulting move that we've made. Yes, so sigma one here, sigma two here, and sigma one here. And then if we compare it with sigma two, uh, composed with sigma one, and then composed with sigma two. It is in fact the same braid because when you look at the blue uh, word line, uh, it can be and can move freely be, between the other ones. So it's really such a move like here. So the one is in fact it could stay just in place, and one and three are sort of encircling it. So it, this is the same braid, but uh, if you write it in terms of the corresponding topological gates, so you like I should write you one here. Uh, u1, u2, u1 is the same as u2 composed with u1 composed with u2. Uh, so this is a completely universal uh, relation that has to be satisfied by any topological quantum gates in 2D. Uh, and there is also this commutative relation which says that if we exchange different pairs of anions, uh, that, that they, they do not talk to each other basically, so we can do it in any order. So i minus j should be bigger than one, yes? Than one, yes. Yeah. Uh, bigger, strictly bigger than one. Yes. <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay, so now that's enough for the abstract setting. Let's let's see how it uh, looks like in uh, in some concrete example. And then the example is is uh, Majorana H touch states. So we start with such a Hamiltonian, and the details are, are really not so important. Uh, so the <clears throat> maybe the formula is not so important, uh, and I'll focus on like some general properties of that. Uh, so we imagine that we have uh, a chain of. Uh, so we, we we've got some a chain, and uh, on the chain there are electrons hopping and they are speedless uh, so there is uh, to have speedless electrons you can say that there is some very big energy splitting between uh, between different spin orientations that forces the or the electrons to have the same spin basically on this chain uh, and then the effective Hamiltonian looks like this so what's here is that uh, on each side we've got some uh, chemical potential, uh, and uh, there is some hopping between sides, uh, and there is this term which is called a superconducting term, uh, and it's imp it's it's important uh, to have it. It's key to have it to have onions here in this setting. Uh, so what we are imagining is that we have such a chain, and in some region of the chain we have no hopping and. Uh, no superconducting term, just some uh, energy penalty when when we when an electron sits on, on on some side here, then there is some energy penalty that it pays. This this the same on this side, but this bit of this chain is is connected <clears throat> by some hopping terms, as 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 this Hamiltonian describes. Uh, and it's important that we have uh, and that delta is not equal to zero. Uh, then, the, if you want to know the details, then I can recommend this paper by Kitai if it's very nicely written. So you can solve this model exactly uh, by Bogolubov transformation. 
And then you will see that uh, this there is a ground space which has dimension two for such a chain. Uh, okay, and then we call this a topological region when the, when those parameters are satisfy those um, conditions. Uh, so the ground space is dimension two, and this and this is because this Hamiltonian has a zero energy eigenmode, uh, and this eigenmode uh, is written as gamma some operator gamma one plus i times, I times gamma two. So you can think that those are like a real part of the uh, annihilation operator and the imaginary part of the annihilation operator, and they are called Majorana operators. And what's key uh, here is that they are localized at the endpoints of this chain. Uh, so they are picked, so gamma two, for instance, is picked here, and it uh, falls down exponentially to the interior of the chain. And the same with, with gamma one that's picked uh, on the left, and it, it falls down exponentially. Uh, okay, so. So just, just for so the, the, so the, this here is a fermionic uh, let's say annihilation of the yes. yes this right is a... and uh, it's a, just, just for students like uh, and it's like a linear combination of uh, annihilation creation of uh, operators sure. of corresponding to different sides and like on one of the box that that is the case means that those coefficients decay along the of course yes yes. Uh, so, Tomek, I think I like I might have got lost because, uh, okay. like uh, previously, you uh, were talking about the Hamiltonian, which is parameterized by some number of parameters, yeah. uh, and now I can, uh, when you give some uh, like specific Hamiltonian, I say only two parameters, as or three maybe is uh, like. Uh, right. So actually, the parameter. So now we want to have the, those parameters were positions of onions. So mm -hmm. you could say that like, effectively, what we have is that this Hamiltonian depends on the positions of gamma one and gamma two ah, that, uh, that define okay. that define the, the its endpoints or something mm -hmm. like that. So sure. The, okay. Okay. Makes sense. Thank you. <laughs> uh, okay. So. So they would translate to some amplitude in the, in the Hamiltonian or more to exact form of those uh, creations? So, so we can diagnose Hamiltonian and you, have, you can rewrite it as E energy times some D, D dagger, right? Uh, sure. And, and one of these is this mode, which has zero energy. Yeah, yeah, but like, uh, no, no, this I totally understand. But uh, yeah. uh, coming back to Philip's question, like there were those parameters, continuous mm -hmm. parameters, mm -hmm. that... Uh, Here there are more discrete, uh, so it's... Uh, I see. So it's like a... Uh, and, and, uh, and it was like important that it was like two, in 2D, right? And here it's like... Uh, that is here it's 1D, yeah. I see, but I see. Right. But you can you can have a model that has this Iorana Majorana uh, edge modes in 2D2. It's called uh, P superconductors, uh, but I I don't know so much about these models. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. and also this is more more related to to, to graphs. Mm -hmm. so. But it's it kind of it fits into the story. So imagine that this line is on on the plane. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So. Now what we can do is that we can, the thing is that we've got those, uh, we've got this topological region here, and then we've got some, uh, a site which is not coupled to it. <clears throat> and what we can do, we can adiabatically switch, switch on the coupling between these two sites and switch on the, uh, uh, the superconducting amplitude so that the topological region extends to this site. And then we can go back to to get back to the original Hamiltonian. That's uh, that's what this model. Uh, we can do it in this model. We can show that then the energy gap is open at all times. Uh, and then if the ground <coughs> if the ground space is written, uh, so let's say that the ground space is zero and one, then so so that then the zero 
annihilates zero and it uh, excites the, uh, yeah, in this way. Then it, uh, one can show that such a transport results with uh, such an operator, which is proportional to identity with some non topological phase. But from the quantum computing perspective, it's, uh, we actually don't care about the global phase so much. So we can say that topologically, it's um, uh, that for um, if this would be if this was a quantum gate, this would be an identity apparently. Uh, and now imagine uh, that we can exchange uh, gamma one and gamma two, and I'm not. I will tell you how to do it exactly in a second, but let's say for the moment that we can magically exchange them. Uh, and this results uh, with such an operator, u1, x of pi over two, gamma one, gamma two. Uh, and then one can check that uh, this, operate, this operator, uh, so for, for u2 would be, it would have gamma two, gamma three here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, but then I, I should write two chains in fact, in what I have it. Yeah, so uh, I hope you will not be too confused now. Uh, such operators satisfy this braiding relation that I was showing you. So which means that those uh, Majorana edge states are in fact some 2D entities because they satisfy this 2D relation. Uh, and everything is derived in this paper. So if you want to know more details, uh, this is actually quite a painful calculation to see what's happening when you exchange those onions. Uh, but that's the, that's the result. So uh, exchange of gamma one and gamma two exchange uh, results of this. And this is always up to a non-topological non global phase factors. Uh, so, so, uh, so this exchange of gamma one and gamma two, what it means is uh, like there is some adiabatic process, so to say, is happening with this wire that you haven't it's, described. It's actually on a network. So we have to, you have to have a, have a network to be able to exchange them. Because you have, I to, see. Keep, you have to keep them separated uh, at all times. You cannot get them too close, because then you get some overlaps mm -hmm. that destroy the topologicality uh, of this. Mm -hmm. So I will give, I'll tell you that this, uh, the details later. But if you've got this, uh, Story with my runner as edge states on the on the plane, then you can just simply exchange them. Uh, but this is a slightly different model than. But then the, the operators are always the same. It's it's always this operator, uh, gamma one, gamma two. Uh, okay, so now let's see uh, how to realize a qubit. So to have a qubit, we have we need to have two chains, two topological regions that are of course separated, uh, and each of them carries one uh, zero energy mode. So this would have d1 and this would have d2. Uh, so the ground space is then uh, a span of, uh, and this this is in the occup occupation number notation. So n1 and n1 modes. Uh, is occupied so so n1 particles occupies mode one and then n2 occupies mode two and these are fermions so these are always zero or one uh, and this is so the ground space is c4 uh, but this operator exchange operator it preserves parity so we can we have to take the ground space with fi fixed parity so let's say whether that we take even parity uh, so this is our ground space, uh, and this is then a qubit. Uh, and in this in this basis, we can write our u one operator. So gamma one, gamma two here. It looks like this. Uh, and u two operator gamma two, gamma three. Uh, it has such a form in this basis. Uh, and they have been derived in this paper. Uh, Sorry, Tomek, is it? Uh... Ah, okay, there is a minus. So that's, that's what uh, sort of the exchange real operators uh, do to our qubit. Uh, 
and to have two qubits we need three chains so now we've got three zero modes this is this gives us c8 and then even let's take even occupation numbers again uh, that's this that's the space and then you can see that this is two qubits because uh, just look at the boat face numbers so zero zero one zero zero one 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 so this gives us two qubits and it can be shown that a c not gate is uh, such a complicated combination of exchanges uh, so maybe you can see that uh, where it is going so uh, can we have universality uh, we have a senior c not gate and some one qubit gates and the answer is that we these are not universal so uh, and adam is a specialist here so uh, maybe uh, he can confirm <laughs> Uh, they are not. <laughs> the, yes, so to have universality, we need a C not gate, an entangling gate, and a universal one qubit gates. And these are not uh, universal one qubit gates. Uh, for instance, this is a finite order gate. If you take to the power of eight, then it's identity. The same, I don't know, maybe power of eight two, I think. And if you combine them, then you always get a finite finite order gate. Uh, so Tomek, you uh, for one qubit you needed two states and for two qubits you need three states. So you only need like one additional uh, state to for uh, like so it's and so we've got mm -hmm. if we've got k chains then uh, we've got k modes which gives, gives us uh, c to the K, yes, two to the K. Um, sorry, yeah. So we, if we've got K chains, that we have K minus one qubits. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. But we need so, to. But we oh, need. To, please, please, I don't want to disturb. Like just finish. Uh, uh, but we need two two K onions, right? So it's actually quite. A yeah, big yeah, sure. But it's quite a big difference between the number of onions and the number of qubits. Um, so, Tomek, I got uh, a bit confused because I'm maybe familiar with this model in a bit like sort of this model I propose in some different context for me. Uh, so, those gates that realize C naught are they all braiding gates? Yes, so this is U3 is so UI is, is, is X for pi over 4 gamma i gamma i plus 1. Right. But they are not always diagonal because they are written in. So the, the, the oh, I, uh, I understand. And then what is then a. Can you go like what is then two qubits? I'm, I'm a bit confused because uh, you. So I'm cube? familiar with the other encoding of qubits, namely for uh, every quadruple of uh, Majorana modes, you have a qubit just by in this positive, local positive parity. Right, this is uh, the other encoding, right? That you can have. Okay, this I, this I don't know. I mean, okay, this is like the one started by by Bravi. In, okay, maybe like the name. Okay, he used same icing onions for that, but these were like the same braiding, right? So the question is like in this, and so how it goes further this this encoding? So you sort of. Uh, yeah, how you encode qubits? Because I didn't get how you get two qubits yet. So it's written here. So we got three occupation numbers, each for each chain. Yeah. And then you take even parity, and it's. Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, the same, the same. But how do you continue with that? So is it like every? So one qubit six. is here. Yeah. The one qubit is. Ah, then how do I continue beyond two qubits? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but yeah, I don't know. Like, I, I don't know. I'm not sure. Because like I, uh, I came across those things, and it's a bit non, a bit non, you know. Because like you are writing here a C naught, right? So I mean, of course, like when you have some specific subspace of a given dimension, I mean, fine, you can realize a C naught pair. But like the question is how those things build together, right? And then, okay, so, so, right. So, so this is. So in this other encoding, uh, you can have like this encoding when you, for given quadruple of my own modes, like gamma one, gamma two, gamma three, gamma four, you have positive parity subspace, which uh, 
So like uh, and your logical zero will be zero zero, your logical one will be one one, mm -hmm. and then you continue. Mm -hmm. But in this encoding, you have uh, you don't get encoding gates. So that's why I was a bit. Uh, I mean, okay. So apparently in this other encoding, as you suggest here, you do have entangling gates. Yeah, here it's you uh, got the signal, to, got, but then you're, you're taking three to have. Two qubits, so that's it. It's like a bit more dense, I guess. Yeah. So the question is, is it does it work just for three qubits? For two qubits, sorry. Or yeah, uh, you know, is yes. it? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. I I don't know how to continue that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Yes, but anyway, the point is that this is not uh, universal, right? So now let's see uh, how we can exchange uh, those those uh, edge states. So imagine that we have a T junction, so we've got coupled chains. Uh, and then we've got this topological region. And then by changing those uh, parameters, uh, uh, coupling constants in the Hamiltonian, then we 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 move this endpoint uh, of the chain, and then first we move it to the right, which I call it move two. Uh, so let's say this is branch two, and this is the, this is branch one. It go, this one goes here, and then uh, onion two goes to the left. So this is move one. Mm. Then move minus two it takes this one back. Uh, and then move minus one takes this one back, and they, you can see that they have exchanged. And maybe uh, you can see that how to, to calculate uh, this adiabatic transport here is a very difficult thing uh, to, to really like, look at all the steps and uh, to take care of the gap and so on. So there are lots of technicalities uh, about this bit and how the. Uh, <clears throat> Superconducting phases have to behave here, so there's like some special conditions for 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 all of it to be well defined, but it, it can be done in a topological way. Uh, and we can also uh, so this would be a counterpart of our simple braid, right? So in two uh, D we had such a braid, but on a T junction we we could draw this braid in this way. Uh, I, I hope you can see the, that this is the same, but just a, a different diagram. Okay, now uh, let's see how to exchange onion two and three. So for this, we need two chains. Uh, and then again, we start, we have to make some space, right? So this one is blocking us. So we have to move this uh, onion one either to right or to the left. Let's move it uh, to the left. Then we take onion two to the right. Uh, and then, okay, and now this three is supposed to go to the left. So it does something like that. And we've got some intersection. And then again, lots of technicalities to do it properly. Uh, and then we move it to one. And then, so those uh, topological regions have now. Have a different configuration, right? Uh, so now one is connected to three and two is connected to four. Uh, and now move minus two, which takes two back, and minus one, minus one, and see they have exchanged. Uh, so what about the braiding relation? Uh, and today we had we had such a such a situation, right? This middle braid could be freely uh, moved uh, but what we have on a tri-junction tri then we've got this simple braid sigma one sigma two where the first particle goes to the left and sigma two where the first particle goes to the right so we've got actually three types of simple braids and if we if we choose sigma two uh, two to one this is what we obtain. So the the point is that uh, now this middle braid is blocked uh, by other braids, right? So it cannot move freely. 
Uh, and the consequence is that uh, there's no braiding relation on the tri junction. Uh, so, in principle, those guys do not have to satisfy the braiding relation. Uh, so, what is the consequence? So, for instance, we could, uh, on the, as, at least on the abstract level, we could have this gate U1 associated to sigma 1 for Majorana fermions. Then again, U2 braids uh, sigma 2, say 1 to 1 braids as a Majorana fermion again. But then sigma 2, 2 to 1 does not have to be like, related to those at all. So we could like, say uh, if the first anion goes to the right, it pulls some switch and it changes the type of onions. And then it exchanges by some uh, gate U2, which is like, absolutely non commutative and doesn't commit it to these guys. And then in principle, we could uh, now have the situation that those gates are, are universal. Uh, and then the precise condition are here in, in the paper of Adam and Kasia Karnas. Mm. So I, I think, my, okay, yeah, uh, it's actually not so easy to, not so difficult to find the U, get U2 prime that that's actually uh, complements those to, to the universality. Uh, so it's not so completely unprobable. Uh, okay, so this is uh, actually the main thing I wanted to tell you. Uh, yeah, Tomek, so there are some constraints on this U2 prime, or is it just no. arbitrary? So from, from the topological point of view, no, there are no constraints. So this is just completely a free group. No, it can be anything, any gate. Uh, now, of course, the question is uh, what physical models uh, can give you such such a situation. This is a completely different question. Mm -hmm. the, those models that those guys study, they actually do satisfy. Yes, they do satisfy braiding correlation, but this is somehow it shows that it's. Um, it's a bit too much of a constraint. Like in principle, if you just start, if you start with some model that's uh, defined on a on a network, the, it, the, they, then the onions they do not have to satisfy the braiding relation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's the that's one of the points. And now, so for the rest of the talk, uh, it's five past three. So maybe. I don't know if I can have two like 10 more minutes, I could. Well, the, the time, like officially, you have 10 more minutes, and ah. have, I letting people to speak longer. Okay, so yeah, I should, I should, that should be enough time. So I just wanted to show you how, how now, how, how this picture can be translated to any arbitrary network uh, and what's going on there with those braid groups. So let's start with trees. So then for a tree, we, we put our onions uh, on some leaf of the tree uh, in, in such an order. And then let's say you want to exchange them on, a, on some junction. So to do this, uh, if you want to take sigma i, braid sigma i that exchanges onion i and i plus one, then uh, onions uh, one up to i minus one are blocking, right? So we have to move them somewhere. Uh, and uh, we are moving them to some uh, to branches of to the branches of this junction uh, somewhere up here, and these numbers determine where we put them. So a one is the number of the branch where we take this onion one. So I could put it like two, then a a one would be two, and so on. And then these are numbers of branches where onions i and i plus one exchange. Uh, and then uh, we can show that such, such braids uh, generate the whole braid group of a tree. Uh, and and then if you take and Sorry, Tomek, can I slow you down? Braid group of a tree. So braid. So I I, I of course like I to some extent I follow, but like maybe you can a bit elaborate on that. <laughs> uh, so what what is a braid group? Where well, uh, yeah. So oh, I was so of a tree. So you're saying that your onions are exchange uh, can only exchange in a tree graph, and there is some braid group associated to it, right? Yeah. Uh, 
So what we had before was a brave group of a junction. So this was the, it was generated by all exchanges of free particles on a T junction are, are generated by those. Uh, mm -hmm. And the, and what I was showing here is that there are no relations between them. So the, the group is freely generated by, by those generators. Uh, by the way, out of curious, okay. So it's like, yeah, somehow like, uh, so, uh, but those objects were there sort of uh, defined before or is it like you defined them here for the first time? You mean say. to defi define the braid group or? On a tree or on a graph or? Uh, uh, well, I, I, I was hoping to maybe not to be too mathematical. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, no, no, but by me, I mean, I don't like because this is some nice mathematics. So my question is like, is it like you guys motivated by this introduced this concept here, yeah. or it existed in mathematics? Ah, yes, of course. Yeah, you can you can define a bright group on any space. So. And this is, I mean, intuitively, it's this is it's just a group of uh, such, you draw such braids stretch in time, modulo uh, continuous deformations, and this forms a group. Uh, mm -hmm. okay. so in, in other way, you, you're asking how we can exchange particles on your space. And mm -hmm. so, so what I'm saying is that any exchange can be written as a composition of these. Uh, uh, and there are no relations between them. So now the question is how to uh, how to exchange particles on a tree. So m m what I'm saying is that uh, it's enough to consider only such exchanges where some particles are distributed here, and then two of them uh, exchange on some fixed branches. On, on some chosen branches, two branches, and then they go back here. And this, uh, and any exchange on a tree can be written as a composition of such rates, of such moves. Uh, and in fact, it's, a, uh, it's even stronger. So any exchange can, can be written uh, by moves that sub satisfy some, such uh, inequalities. So the first uh, onion, it goes, to some branch, then the other one cannot go to a lower branch, and so on. And then it's again fully generated, so there are no relations on the tree. Uh, and now, uh, to consider general networks, we need to consider something which is called a total braid. Uh, so in 2D, uh, we'd call a total braid something which is a product of all simple braids, and this is such a move. So one, uh, so sigma one, and sigma two, uh, if, if we have just three onions. Uh, yeah. yeah, so uh, in, uh, in other words, then the, the first onion goes to the, end, to the end of the line always. And then one can show that the planar braid group is generated only by sigma one in such a total braid. So this is maybe also a bit surprising that you can have only two generators for the planar braid group. And and this is because any simple braid is uh, can can be expressed as a, expressed as a conjugation of you know, sigma r one with the total braid many many times. Uh, so for a general network, so what we are doing, we, we we can have loops. If it's not a tree graph, we can have a, we have we can have some loops. So we pick our favorite loop that's uh, somehow on the boundary of the network. And for a starting point, we take some uh, some edge of, uh, that lies on this loop, and it's, it's also on the it has to be on the boundary of this network too. And then that's where we distribute our onions. Uh, and then you can consider such a move where the first onion moves around this loop to the back of the line. Sorry, Tomek, but this network is planar, yes? It, it is always planar, yeah. Otherwise, there is no boundary. Mm -hmm. So it's all, we imagine that it's like an architecture that's on a on a plane on, on a table, and then we are moving on. Yeah, optical table almost. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so and then the total break is that we move the first onion to the back of the line, 
Uh, and how to see this? Uh, well, one has to consider uh, another situation where we move uh, annuals one up to n minus one to this uh, stick, to this leaf, uh, and then this one, this nth onion goes around here, and then they all go back. And one can show that this move gamma uh, is such a composition of simple braids and braid delta. Uh, but now gamma is actually a one particle move because there was no exchange. So uh, let, let's say we want to take a quotient by such means. Uh, so we don't want to uh, assign any operators to like, sort of non-exchanges. Uh, and this, then this expression identifies this delta move, like very simple move, uh, with, with this total braid, which is a product of all simple braids. And then, uh, take, so recall this re relation, we can have the same thing on the, on such a graph. It's, it's called a lollipop graph, by the way. Uh, and for this, we can write it. Uh, any sim some simple braid of this form is a, is a conjugation of just sigma one with delta. But now we can see the difference. There are twos and then there are ones. So these are in fact different simple braids. Uh, but this is because we are taking a very small graph. Uh, and the point is that for bigger networks, which are two connected, so between any pair of vertices, we have two independent paths. There are many, many such lollipop such networks, subnetworks there. Uh, and then, if we write down all relations that I wrote on the previous slide, they actually imply that any simple braid uh, does not, uh, it's actually like all simple braids with different distributions of onions are, 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 are identified with each other. Uh, so, for any AA prime, it's enough to. Uh, fix i and fix the two branches where they exchange and fix the vertex uh, and then we don't we don't care about the distribution of the other onions uh, so what it means is that for two connected networks we reproduce some of the two two d braiding relations but they are for fixed vertex in the network and for some fixed branches so still, in principle, for different branches, for different vertices, we have different uh, generators, right? So they are independent. Uh, but now, if we add, if we assume that our network is highly connected, so free connected, and there are three paths between any pair of vertices, uh, then uh, they form a so-called theta subnetwork, and there are some new relations which I will skip. Uh, but the point is that now all simple braids are identified with each other thanks to these uh, relations. So for a free connected network, the, the braiding is always the same as in 2D. Uh, so free connected, yeah. So then, so uh, most differences uh, appear in low uh, and two connected networks and on junctions and on trees and so on. But when you have such a dense free connected network, then there is no difference. Uh, and this is all described in those two papers uh, with Bianchi and <coughs> uh, so formally, like, mathematically, this is the problem of describing presentations of braid groups on the graph. Uh, okay, but okay, so this is uh, a bit technical, but now I wanted to tell you what it means for maybe for some topological quantum computing again. Uh, so we can imagine a network that has uh, two free connected components. So every exchanges, uh, all exchanges are identified with it within one component. So they both behave like 2D, but then the whole thing is two connected because that's, uh, uh, the modules are connected only by two sort of rails. Uh, and this means that uh, topologically, at least, we can have some braid uh, if we extend onions 
I and I plus one here we have some braiding relations. So sorry, some braiding operator, some exchange operator, some gate. Uh, and then when we move them here, uh, the same pair, we exchange with a different gate, just automatically sort of it's built in into a model that by going back and forth, we realize different gates with the same pair. So that's some even maybe even more plausible than what we had for a junction. And those gates do not depend on the distribution of other onions. So that's even nicer. Uh, this has been uh, observed already for abelian onions uh, in the paper by Harrison, Keating, Robbins, and Adam Savitsky. Uh, and this, uh, so I should also mention that uh, this, this group also was, this group from Bristol was uh, one of the first groups who, who studied such uh, models of onions and networks from this perspective. So uh, now there is only Jonathan Robbins who is in Bristol. <laughs> Uh, okay, so a summary. What I've shown that uh, is that a fa this topological fundamental study of braiding on networks shows in principle many ways towards the re realization of uh, universal quantum grades, right? Because uh, there are less constraints. So yes, so we had more generators and re less realizers on, net on networks in comparison to 2D. Uh, now, uh, can we have some physical realizations of this? Uh, like in, uh, particles called gra graphians, for instance. <laughs> that's that's not, not my idea to call them like that. But, uh, uh, so ca how could one have such graphians? Uh, so uh, one way would be, would be to take uh, quantum field theory and translate fusion rules to, to those bra graph braid groups. Uh, and this is an on ongoing effort. Actually, and the, so the important thing is that the fusion rules they depend on the on the braid group itself. So uh, there will be a huge difference, in fact. Uh, another, another idea, uh, but this is a bit vague. Uh, there are quantum chains with multiple edge modes. So what I was showing you is uh, with Majorana edge modes is like the simplest instance of. Uh, of a chain that has some edge modes. Uh, in principle, when you switch on some second nearest neighbor, uh, hopping and so on, you can have multiple edge modes, and maybe, maybe then they satisfy the the generalized braiding relation. So they, they give some more freedom, or maybe they give some new quantum gates. That's not. Uh, I don't know. I can see, but maybe that's possible. Uh, yes, and that's that's all. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Tomek, for a very interesting talk. We have uh, time for questions, comments. Right. Uh, so I have a general question. Uh, do you know what is the current like state of the art about experimental signatures of like any topological states that can be used for so actually this year there's, there's been some big breakthrough because they uh, okay not for quantum computing because they had uh, there was some the breakthrough was that they discovered they, they finally ma managed to do the experiment of uh, uh, interference right with uh, of top of uh, abelian onions. Uh, Mm -hmm. So this shows that abelian onions can be detected experimentally like without any loopholes. And this has happened ju just this year. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure what, what about uh, non-abelian onions. I know that there are, there are some setups with Josephson junctions uh, and some uh, and some Josephson and, and opt uh, not optical, but uh, pro sorry, photonic, photonic, photo, some photonics experiments uh, that can do, or they can simulate such a uh, such an exchange of onions. But then there's it's really they are simulating because they, they are not having some Majorana edge states. They are, they are simulating some Hamiltonians there, I think. So it's really mm -hmm. debatable whether. They really have it, or 
or not. But then, okay, the, some experiments have been done and then uh, it's not completely, uh, like the field is, uh, is still developing, I think. Yeah. Sure, yeah. But, the, yes, but anyway, the, the model has been recognized and there have been like many attempts to, to do it on, 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 a, T on a T junction. We've, we've just, we've mm -hmm. just two patch points. Questions, comments? So I have one. Um, so when you have this base group on, a, yeah, like on this graph, you don't know uh, what would be the day. Do you have a control over the, like a dimension of the corresponding Hilbert space where those uh, uh, movements are represented? Like, Upper bound on it or lower bound on it? You mean for the for graph for a graph? Yeah, yeah, for computation, right? Uh, yeah. So you have this graph uh, mm -hmm. and some particles moving there, and like. Uh, yes, no. I, mean, no I understand that you study you study uh, the the Bray group on this graph. Mm -hmm. But then this base group has like the corresponding representation. So I guess those representations would be something in which you realize the yes. So then, so we could, computation. Yeah. Uh, Quantum. Yes, yes. So we can uh, you can ask uh, whether so there are, there's like this problem which uh, representations are physically realizable, and this is partially answered by doing this topological quantum field theory with fusion rules. And this will give you some, some answer for, um, but then this hasn't been like, really done for graphs yet. Uh, so. Uh, but for 2D, just for uh, for the standard bridge group, do for, people expect what? For, for, for 2D, it depends on your model, on the type of onions that you have. So if you take those Majorana fermions, that, that then you saw you saw the, the dimension, right? It was two to uh, half of the number. Three over two. Yes. Uh, if you take different onions, then you, you'll have different uh, different dimensions, but they roughly always grow like two to the <clears throat> uh, two to the number of onions. Uh, I, I suppose we can also have qubits, but I don't know par any particular examples uh, for having qubits. But you're, in principle, we can have them too. Uh, and there's also this uh, sort of fundamental, fundamental constraint, uh, uh, which says that if you want to have a non-trivial representation of a braid group, then the dimension of the representation has to be uh, oh, I don't. I don't want to see. I kind. Of, I kind of forgot it. It's uh, at least linear with the number of particles. I, I think so it's at least n or two n. Mm -hmm. uh, something like that. So there is there is like this mathematical result, which says that uh, if your dimension is too small, then all representations are abelian. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's um, the, the the threshold is n or two n. I'm not sure. Now. Right. I take liberty to ask you one more question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like you mentioned, that in the case when you have like three dimensional space and the rotation group, mm -hmm. uh, like those things that you get in the end are equivalent to bosons and fermions so can you because actually permutation group is quite i mean in a sense it's a like a large quite a large group right it has quite a few elements mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. uh right so in, in what sense uh yeah in what sense uh they're uh, like it's the bosons and fermions like uh so as far as my, I, I didn't really read the paper because it's like in a language that I don't understand. They are using uh, relativistic 
some relativistic methods to relativistic quantum mechanics to show it. But I think it, uh, the result is that uh, if you take any model of onions, you can kind of ungauge it. Uh, so you can have a gauge transformation which uh, brings your onion to to a boson, in fact, or, or a family. Uh, so in the sense that you can, uh, how to say that? I mean, so you mean, but, but fundamentally, I guess we are interested then there in representations of the elements of the permutation group. So they would be represented somehow in this space, yes, whatever yes. the space it is, and the point is from our considerations, one can get that it would be effectively just, I know, some copy, some copies of fermion, like many copies of fermionic spaces, and copies of bosonic spaces, stuff like that. And the, like, is it like, is that the, like, how one should understand the statement? Uh, mm. okay, I'm, I'm not sure I can answer that. <laughs> uh, okay. I can send you the paper. <laughs> No, sure. No, sorry, sorry. I just because uh, you know much more about those things. That's why I'm like, mm -hmm. of course, I'm motivated by computation. Like, uh, but there are some interesting case sets happening. So. But they call it uh, so. There are those parafermions, right? So the parafermion would, would correspond to an interior representation of a permutation group. Uh, I think there are some results about quantum computing of parafermions. Mm -hmm. Aren't there? Yeah. So. I guess they are useful too. Maybe they are not. Um, it's not so easy to get the topologically protected gates or something like that. I'm not sure. I don't know. I, I didn't really read too much about this. Sure, sure. No, but it's no. I, I'm, I'm just uh, using it on some. No worries. <laughs> yeah. Right. And more uh, last chance to ask something to Tomek. Right. So. Yeah, if there are no further questions, let's thank the speaker again. Many thanks, Tomek. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the great talk.